Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks TMLS for having me. Uh, I'm Dan Adamson. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Armilla AI. And today I'm going to talk to you about AI in human resource systems, HR systems. And um, we're going to look at it a little more deeply, uh, some public examples, some examples that we've seen as well, and uh, where these systems have gone off the track and uh, how to uh, prevent and uh, detect these issues. Uh, just a little bit more about me. I have acted as a vendor selling AI solutions into um, different organizations, including uh, many of the world's largest financial institutions, uh, material models that had strict validation requirements. Um, I've also helped develop uh, HR AI software as well, um, and have worked with regulators globally, so on the other side, um, both in an educational manner and also helping them with uh, regulatory actions and monitorship work. Um, I'm the co-founder of Armilla AI, which is a responsible AI startup, which we'll talk a little bit more about today, and, and we'll show you more about what we do. Um, so first of all, let's just speak broadly here about the importance of AI regulation. Um, there have been a lot of advancements globally uh, around the EU, for example, creating uh, AI regulation that's now up in review. Um, there are other regulations that are both broad and consumer based, like the um, Act in California, which goes live uh, next year. Um, there are others that are more specific in, in specific industries. And as these are going live shortly, um, one of those specific industries is in HR. And New York City passed a local law, Local Law 144, which uh, requires the independent audit of HR systems where they utilize AI or more broadly um, algorithmic decisioning. And it's very broadly applicable because it applies to anyone who has been operating in New York with employees. And so if you are hiring or you have a operational presence, um, you need to adhere to this law. And so the law is based around discrimination against um, gender bias, uh, race and ethnic bias as well. And it requires that results are made publicly available and there are penalties for, for not. So um, this law goes into effect January and uh, we've done a lot of work recently at Armilla assessing these systems um, to be to ensure compliance with with local law 144. Um, so I really call the landscape today a minefield of bad AI and what I mean by that is that occasionally uh, you see an issue in the news um, one uh, sort of well-reported issue was around Amazon's um, HR AI screening system, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, but this happens occasionally in all industries. Um, in the financial industry, for example, there were, um, you know, there's often fines that come out of issues with uh, these various AI systems. Um, but I refer to this as a minefield because a lot of these issues lurk and they remain undetected, meaning when we go in and perform an audit, we might find that there are issues there and hopefully these issues never make it to the news, but um, these issues are definitely lurking. And so uh, when we talk about uh, all of these issues, it's, it's, it's important to have a broad context of why these issues are occurring. And I think it's a combination of reasons. Um, one is that AI is a fast evolving field and, and that means that things are evolving quickly. It also means that AI is becoming much more accessible. And that means that at a click of a button, I can create a very sophisticated model 
that's very complicated, but not necessarily understand the domain or the ramifications or how to um, fully assess whether it's a good model or bad model. I might have very simple performance metrics that I can use to, to assess that model, but I don't necessarily need a deeper understanding of the risks of deploying that model and, and what to look for. And that, that is very dangerous, that disconnect. Um, another issue is that uh, traditional validation, and a lot of this traditional validation comes from um, what was done in model validation groups that looked at decision trees or rule-based systems or general linear equations. Um, they really weren't built for testing AI. And so there's this sort of bad match between what's being done in terms of validation and what's required. Um, another issue is that those validation processes have actually become uh, very onerous. And we were subject in sort of my previous uh, work to often these year-long validation processes. And um, so what happens then is that organizations try to circumvent that and they use a bunch of reasons for not performing these validations, understandably. Um, but it means that only the most material models that are deemed the highest impact or that have a regulatory requirement to be tested are, are formally validated. And that's quite dangerous, right? Because it means that it leaves a whole bunch of models that are not tested. Um, towards that middle point around the tools that are out there, um, it really is <laughs> like bringing a knife to a gunfight. And so unless you have somebody who's really good with a knife, <laughs> it's a really dangerous situation. And you don't want to have to, as an organization, rely on your model validators all being like a Rambo with a knife, right? Because we know that's that's not the case. Not everybody can be um, very good with a knife when they should be bringing a gun, right? And so um, we see this often where they're using these sort of traditional approaches or traditional tools, or they're just using um, open source tools that they might have slapped together thinking that they're testing things properly when when often they aren't. Okay, so um, speaking a little uh, more specifically about uh, HR systems, uh, this was an example uh, that was well covered in the press and it highlights a lot of the sort of risks around these systems. Um, Amazon had a recruitment tool that they had um, that was able to screen for and select um, developers that uh, they would recruit. And um, the problem that they noticed was that it started um, recruiting mostly male developers, right? And Amazon, um, you know, is, is not uh, immature around its AI practices. Right, so um, you know it was interesting to take a deeper look at this, and of course, uh, they didn't make available to their recruiting engine um, gender, right? So they hid that from the training of the system, but um, the system still learned, and it turned out that this was quite likely through resumes that it was being trained against. Um, it was able to correlate. Uh, either words or phrases in those resumes and determine the, the gender essentially of the candidates. Um, this was also perpetuated by their real world data that they fed to the, the recruiting engine where in real life they had ended up hiring more male developers, right? So um, it was of no surprise that they actually uh, build a tool that was biased against women. Um, this is troubling for a number of reasons, but it's also, uh, you know, one of the, the issues that wasn't covered well um, was that this tool actually could perpetuate bias and make it worse. And so, you know, these systems, right, if this goes undetected and you go to periodically retrain the tool, um, you can find that over time, it's 
not only going to reflect those biases that are inherently there, but also perpetuate them and, and exacerbate them, right? So in this case, if you have this engine running, guess what's going to happen? You're going to mostly interview um, male developers, and then you're going to mostly hire male developers. And then when you go to retrain the engine against their resumes, you're going to even more heavily weight those um, correlations and in the future rounds end up um, interviewing even more in a more skewed way, right? And so over time, you can actually perpetuate these biases and exacerbate them. Um, so a little bit about Armilla uh, itself. So we built a QA for ML framework and we'll show you more about that today in the different examples that we'll go through. Um, but we believe that there are some important pillars and a lot of the testing that we do maps against these, these pillars or principles um, that we do testing of these AI systems. We um, believe that data is an important piece to assess, right? So um, was the input data that you use to train your, your models, was it biased? Because if it was and you do nothing about that, for example, your uh, models themselves will also be biased in all likelihood. Um, the transparency of the systems, the performance of the systems, right? These are all important pillars. Um, bias and fairness of the systems and robustness of the systems. And often, um, you know, today what happens is that models are often chosen for their performance alone. And that's probably the wrong approach to take because we've seen many instances, for example, where robustness is actually more important than performance because the most top performing model might actually be quite brittle. And when you expose it to real world data, um, you end up with a system that doesn't perform as well against uh, real world data, which is often, often messier than what you've trained against, or there might be some data drift, uh, which it can't, um, which it's, can't perform as well against, right? So um, the last pillar is around accountability. Um, you know, what systems and processes do you have in place and can you track your models across the life cycle and over time, right? So um, I'm gonna now touch on a real world, another real world example, and we'll, we'll jump into some examples after that. Um, but this is illustrative uh, for a different reason. Now this was actually a surveillance system, but a lot of the HR systems that we have uh, tested work the same way where it's a, um, a series of models that the flow um, of data um, flows through, right? So um, it might be a series of these models and the system itself, um, the output is a consequence of that data flowing through all of those um, individual models. And so in a surveillance system, right, you might start with some crawling tasks that might extract data, and then you might um, move into some basic NLP tasks to sort of understand that data at a basic level. And then you might have an event layer on top of that where you might actually then try to deduplicate these events and then alert on a subset of them, right? So all of these are, um, you know, you could think of these as a pipeline. It's very important to test each of those models and look at them from the perspective of not just the overall performance, which in this case was stellar. So when you looked across the entire system, there was a 97% accuracy right, against their, their test set, um, but also look at the individual components of the system, right? So in this case, when you looked at each of those components, um, you could see that it was performing well. Now, what happened in the real world is that actually got a little more complicated and they started to apply this surveillance system against um, not just English text, which it had been trained against, but other text, which it then translated into English. And in the real world settings, the accuracy dipped uh, severely, right? And so very important that you look at realistically um, each of those each of those systems or each of those models 
the system holistically and then also make sure that it's reflective that data that's coming in is reflective of the data that has been trained against and in this case actually you could view that translation step as as an individual step which you could test individually but then that whole system has to include that as bounds and so armilla um, was designed to uh, be able to test um, essentially unit test those individual models as well as holistically test the systems um, and what we found is that you really do need that blend right and so often when we assess a system it might be assessing multiple models including the system itself with the overall inputs and outputs um, when we translate that into hr um, Often uh, systems like resume ranking actually have multiple models. They might actually have an NLP uh, model itself. They might then um, do a ranking or a regression or a classification model and use the predict PRABA to um, actually rank candidates, for example. Um, and it's important to test those. So it's important to test those individually. You can find biases in each of those models as well as holistically. When we when we look at what's needed for the local law 144 in New York, uh, they have very specific requirements that are at a minimum. The um, looking at the EEOC um, framework of gender and race um, that they've built around equal opportunity already right so they're reusing um, some of the measures and that, that would be applied to a to an organization and saying apply those same measures to that individual system to determine whether it's biased or not and and so that looks a little bit like this in terms of the assessment uh, you can see this example here where um, it looks like when we go to the um, impact ratio here, uh, they generally go by a four-fifths rule, which means that you need to have an impact ratio within 80%. Um, this, system, this system barely breaks that. Um, so uh, you can see that the, or it's, it barely passes. I'm not a big believer in uh, that is the true threshold, and we might show some examples where where this breaks down. Um, but even then, that's not ideal, right? Having a 80% impact ratio. So here, when we go and look at this a little deeper, you can see that actually they had very few uh, female Asian applicants, for example. And so this might be a situation where they need to get more test data somehow, right? And and um, and have a stronger sampling uh, to be able to determine whether this, um, you know, whether the system is biased or not. Uh, I'm going to jump over and show you the system working now. Um, so bear with me one second as I switch screens. Okay, hopefully you can see this. So this is this is a system. This is our Milla running uh, with some demo examples here. Um, I'm going to jump into a few of these projects and just show you uh, some basics around how this is set up. Um, I'm going to start with a uh, classification model here, for example. Um, so this is this is a, um, a promotion model. Now this would would fall under the scope of uh, New York uh, Local Law 144 as well, uh, potentially where you're using this to determine what employees to promote. Uh, we've seen other models like um, employee churn models that have been used as a component of these HR promotion models. Um, so that would fall under, you know, at that point under the, uh, the law as well. Um, but uh, this is a classification model and basically uh, you can use it as a ranking model with the predict prava, but this is a classification model and it's been set up um, as a standalone model. You can set how to access that model. You can add in the data sets or where to access those data sets. Um, you can also set up the test plans for this model. Um, when you go and set up this, we have different um, 
different templates. And these test plans are important, an important artifact. They, they really um, represent what is required in these tests, whether it's a formal assessment that we come in and, and perform ourselves, or whether it's being used by the development team in the R&D phase, or whether uh, it's a, a formal internal validation, or whether you're you're monitoring your model in production and it's it's in the production phase. Um, all of these tests, um, you know, you can drill into given the model type, uh, the types of tests that are performed, um, that's all configurable as well as the thresholds. And so you can have business input. Uh, you can also specify specific scenarios where it has to pass. Um, but the business, for example, can contribute uh, you know, their requirements, any regulatory requirements can be added. Um, and it becomes this sort of single history um, and single definition of what's required, right? So uh, from there, you can run a specific model uh, or models against this to test them, you know, potentially in the R&D phase uh, or to formally validate a specific candidate. And you can compare them even across environments, right? So you could go in and, and say, how does this R&D model compare against the production model? Or, uh, you know, it, it, when I move this model from R&D to validation, is it performing in the same way? Uh, there's an API to kick these off. You can kick them off in, uh, in a Jupyter notebook as well. Uh, so it's a very flexible approach to testing. Uh, I'm just going to drill into a, this run now. So in this HR promotion model, uh, they're really they're saying, okay, given this data about a, can, a, a potential employee for promotion, um, you know, how would you rank or would you promote this candidate? And uh, you can see here that we have something called uh, fingerprinting. And I'll come back and talk about this a little more. But this fingerprinting allows you to have an overview of the model. It's potentially also making recommendations across different sets. Um, and it's also trying to build up this overall assessment of, of that model. And you can see that there's issues here um, around the data itself, right? It looks like there's some bias issues. It looks like um, there's uh, some issues around performance, um, around explainability, and around fairness of the model itself as well. So we'll dive into those, uh, some of those a little more. Uh, but this does some of the tests that you would expect. Here's um, actually, this is an interesting um, example here. I'm just going to jump in and show you, uh, you know, a preview of some of the issues here. Uh, you can see that, um, you know, there's different, uh, different strengths of um, correlations. And so when we go back and we look at why some of this might be biased, it might be, um, in fact, because of some of these correlations. But uh, we'll come back to that. Here we're seeing that there's some class imbalance issues. And um, probably that's normal because, um, you know, in this case, it's being trained against real world data. And in real world data, there's a lot more probably employees who are not promoted versus promoted. Um, we've set up this test plan to look at some of the sort of standard um, metrics that you would expect around performance. Um, we've also looked into the explainability of the model and the uh, interpretability of the model. Um, and I'm really going to just, you know, jump into some of the more important pieces around this model itself. Um, but uh, in this case, um, you're going to, you know, sort of see here that there are some issues uh, in fairness around this model. And you can see that long absence, uh, there's a risk around that. Um, there's a risk around gender as well. And so if I jump into those uh, specific areas of this model, and I'm just going to uh, you know, jump into long absence. Uh, first of all, the question is, why is this, this a risk, right? Because this is, uh, this is around gender, <laughs> right? Uh, and race, that this assessment should be done. Well, in this case, we see that the model actually performs very poorly and there's disparate impact around these long absences. And then when we go back to the data uh, and you look at the correlations, it turns out that um, long absences are actually highly correlated against maternity leaves, uh, which skew heavily towards towards women, right? And so actually this becomes a proxy 
uh, feature almost around gender, right? So um, this detected the, you know, these potential biases automatically, sort of piecing those together. Um, it also looks at the robustness of the model. And uh, so in this case, um, there were some issues, right, around around uh, the model itself and its, its ability to perform around um, when drift or um, permutation testing happens. Right, so this is a this is actually a classic example. I could um, drill into gender itself here. Um, you know, just going back to the issue here with this model. Let me just pull up gender. Right, um, you can see here uh, again that the model actually performs poorly um, when you compare how it performs between males and females. Very specifically, for example, the false positive rate is much higher in, um, I think, just a second here, in um, in males in this case. And so it's biased actually against females. That said, uh, when you look at the variables here in the traditional measures, um, it doesn't appear to be biased, right, around equal opportunity or um, demographic parity. So, um, so although you know it's overall, you know, they're around traditional measures of bias. It's it looks like it's within um, the safe range. Um, the model still has issues in certain areas of performance, right? So, um, these are all things you want to take a look at and adjust. Now that said, when you go into something like the um, local law 144, you have to weigh that and say, well, okay, uh, the model might be weak here, but overall around disparate impact, it's actually within um, the threshold of fairness set, right? So, um, so that's where it gets a little tricky, right? But uh, for sure, these are things that you should at least consciously be looking at and then determine whether to take actions or not around those. Um, I'm going to jump into uh, an unstructured example here. Um, so this is actually within a, a larger resume ranking system here. So resume strength, resume rankings largely and you know, generally an unstructured type of problem where it's looking at the resume uh, text and ranking the candidate against a position. Um, here, the first step in that model, and this is so it becomes a unit test in the overall system testing, is this um, named entity recognition. And that's important. It might be pulling out, for example, skills or you know entity names, and then using those as part of the next step of its assessment. And so when I go in and look at this model, because this is unstructured, it's going to have uh, different tests available to test the system. Uh, but one of those tests here is actually uh, this overlap of robustness and fairness, right? So um, in this case, we are looking at a whole bunch of resumes and um, text flowing through those resumes. And we're going to check uh, how the system performs when we switch genders, right? So if we take a he and we make it a she, um, or if we take a uh, name of somebody and uh, you know take Paul and turn it into Margaret, um, does the model perform well? And in this case, it does actually. And so in this case, uh, you know there under um, you know these examples, it actually if it detected a person previously in the old model, if you switch the name around. Um, it still detects the person or the entity there in the new, the new model. So great performance, that's that's wonderful. Now we're doing a, a permutation test around um, around race and ethnicity, however, and it starts to fail. So here, when we take um, a very Western name and we replace it with a uh, a name that it might not be accustomed to. Um, you know, so here's, for example, uh, you know, replacing a Clinton with a Roland or um, uh, Lucia, right? So as we go and replace these, we actually find that there are issues where um, the model picked up on the entity in the first original utterance, but in the second case, it did not, 
right? So um, what does this mean, right? And actually it had a pretty dismal failure rate, about 79%. Right, and so um, really, what this points to is probably this model was trained against very Western data, right? And so, in this case, you, you might not even detect this as a root cause of the overall bias or, or lack of performance of the system around ethnicities. Um, but by unit testing this individual model within this larger system, we can now tell the the vendor here or the the data scientist actually you need to go and get um, you know, more Eastern, uh, train train your system against uh, different data sets, not just Western likely media or resumes, right? So, um, so that's an example of a system or a subsystem that was failing and it went undetected. And it isn't until you start to sort of pick apart and look at those individual components and then look at different ways of testing those components that you really see where, where those models are weak, okay? Um, Okay, I'm just going to show you one more example here, um, or illustrate one more example. So this is uh, this is a resume screening uh, system as well. Uh, this is actually the the resume screening ranking component, which is using a, I guess a, a TensorFlow model um, here, and you can see that uh, when we go in and assess the fairness, uh, we can see straight off that uh, there are issues around the fairness around gender here, right? So um, we can see that, uh, you know, in a few areas, the model performs poorly uh, for females. And um, again, even though most of these traditional measures didn't pick up on or was safe within, within the bias range, the allowable bias range, um, we saw these, these, these issues around performance here. Um, it's very important to have a perspective when you start testing these systems. Um, so when you go and look at the, the actual format that's required by the New York Law 144, um, oftentimes you can put forward uh, uh, your best foot around how these systems are tested, but um, it's equally important to really get an understanding from the business and from the regulatory perspective of, you know, really, what are the underlying um, potential risks here? And then use that to start to determine what are the important attributes here? What are the important measures, right? So um, are you going after equal opportunity, uh, fairness? Uh, all of that you know, needs to be a collaboration between data scientists and uh, you know, the business. Right. So often when we come in to do these assessments, one of the first things we do is establish what the criteria are and what the understanding is of both the data science teams, the business teams, the and, and the legal teams around, um, you know, what's important, what are important measures. OK, so uh, to, to summarize and uh, uh, review some of these learnings. Um, you know, I do think it is a, a real team effort, right? This is another way of saying this. When you create those test plans, right? When you do those assessments, it's important that you get the input from all of the parties and that you have a proper level of, of, of validation and governance around that, right? So um, is it working in R&D, right? Is it working the same way when it goes into production? Um, are you monitoring that system? Are you repeating those tests? Are you taking batches out? Or are you real-time monitoring to make sure that the system's still working? Are you sampling, right? Are you detecting drift? Um, all of that, you know, properly requires uh, collaboration. Um, as you can see from these tests, though, it can be fairly systematic, and that means that it doesn't have to be these high overhead processes to be effective. In fact, um, it's very important that you test for performance, that you test for uh, fairness, that you test for robustness, and often these are interrelated concepts. If the system performs poorly in one area, um, you may have issues around fairness or bias for a subset of your population, right? If if your if your system's not very robust, you might have 
um, issues and fairness issues might arise when you go to actually perform against real world data, right? So all of that's important to test. Um, and the last part here is, you know, just because there can be that efficiency um, and even if you don't need to strictly do all of these tests, um, it's not much effort, much more effort to do them properly. And so don't rely on, you know, the fact that you don't need to strictly do all of these tests. Um, you still want to make sure that you're putting together, uh, you know, a fairly comprehensive test plan and a fairly comprehensive set of tests when you're um, validating your models and and just be efficient about it right and and maybe there's a stricter process for your more material models but uh very important that you do test your models and that you are testing for the right things right and again that goes back to point number one where um, it's really a uh, a group initiative that matters so hopefully this was useful to you uh today and and uh thank you very much for your time um, if uh, you are, if you do have any questions um, or want to find out more about uh, Armilla AI, or if you have any problems that you're tackling and uh, want any advice, please, um, you know, feel free to reach me or any of our team. I can be reached uh, at uh, dan at armilla.ai and look forward to uh, discussing. Thank you.